Welcome back to the Consult Centre podcast with me, your host, Ruth Wilkinson. Your podcast for all things in startup business, PR, digital, raising the awareness of your brand, featuring interviews with local and successful business owners, giving you the benefit of their help and advice. Enjoy the show. So hello and welcome to another edition of the Consult Centre podcast. I I am really looking forward to this one. I am joined Mm -hmm. by Dominic Maloney. Good morning. Good morning, Ruth. How are we? What a a, uh, momentous week it's been, the podcast. At the start of the week, we've had Springsteen and Obama together. And at the end of the week, we've got Ruth and Dom. And I've got my guitar over there. So, uh, (laughs) you know, might play a few of the old, uh, old songs before the end of the show. Anything is possible. Anything, Anything is possible at this point. Yeah. So for those people that may not have met you and may not have listened to you before on a podcast, well, first, God help them. Secondly, let's introduce yeah. you. You yeah. are the Global Head of Human Resources for Motorsport Network. Yeah, correct. Uh, I have been one for the last five months. Uh, I've been there. Uh, and do you want me to give a bit of background? In I reckon of- I reckon yeah. people need to That'd know exactly yeah. what this is about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gosh. So... Uh, Man and boy in HR almost. I started in the early 90s. I worked in retail, Littlewoods, if anybody remembers good old Littlewoods. And I worked in index and catalog shop. And then like many, in fact, all HR people kind of fell into HR. No one was ever told at the careers fairs they had in, at school in the evening. Oh, yes, to what you need to do is you need to go to, uh, to well, human resources didn't exist, personnel. Uh, <laughs> personnel. <gasps> personnel. That gives me, do you yeah, know what? Yeah. That, gi- that, that gives me visions of... The guy with the trolley of envelopes that would just yeah. walk around the office and you had yeah. to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Guilty as charged. Um, so that was my first role, personnel and training officer for Littlewoods International, no less. Uh, that, so I they have big ideas. It was a big organisation. But yeah, I kind of wait, went around various bits of Littlewoods and its organisation, index the catalogs, so remember them, and the... Uh, Catalog the you know, Littlewoods catalogs pre internet, folks. Imagine <laughs> you had to go and uh, look at a printed catalog and then phone up an order. Those are the days. Uh, and, then, and then, very quickly after that, I got a role with a business called Amadeus, who were a ticketing systems for airlines travel agencies. Uh, and I'm a bit of a Hispanophile and speak Spanish fluently, etc. And that was based out of Madrid. So took myself and my very young family, my wife and a, a six-month-old daughter, over to Madrid for three years and then came back and got a job uh, at a uh, business called Sunterra up here in sunny Lancaster, which is where I met a young, fair, eager Ruth <laughs> in her first time and made one of the biggest faux pas in a uh, interview ever, <laughs> where I mispronounced best practice. <laughs> I can't believe that you remember that so well. Oh, man, it's, 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 it darkens me even to this day. <laughs> um, and, it can't, that, and it definitely can't have been as a prompt of my physical physique, because that definitely wasn't available. <laughs> I'm not that kind of HR director. Yeah, so that, and, that, and that followed up was my first proper HR lead role there. And, and we, uh, you know, Ruth and I had a fantastic time, didn't we, uh, there. It was a... Um, scrappy business and i still say to these uh, to this day if someone tells me what a tough time it is in an organization i go you think this is tough <laughs> i've worked in timeshare <laughs> so. i mean let, let's just let's just pause for a minute to remember both the good and the bad of that particular business it was i mean as a hr director in that business you had a full plate of stuff didn't you not just the not just the everyday Contracts, employee engagement, in benefits, conversations, recruitment. I mean, it, it, it was a battle, full onslaught, wasn't it? I had gone from a, being part of an HR team in a highly corporate, consummate, uber professional European business like Amadeus uh, to being the HR lead for the first time in my career in a business that was... Well, it was timeshare. So it was, well, it was the, it was the equivalent of a bare knuckle fight, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. And we we had a great MD who came on board just after I joined, a guy called Dave Harris, who had come from another part of travel. He came from going places and was desperate to kind of clean up the act of Sunday. But unfortunately. Uh, and, and apologies uh, if anybody's listening on this uh, podcast who used to work there, but they, they know who they are. Uh, there were there were old school uh, uh, yeah. timeshare people there, and you know, yeah, I mean, I had to do things like 
go down to the Canaries to close down a couple of the sales decks because not only were they selling timeshare, but they were also selling cocaine around the back <laughs> and things like that. So yeah, it was it was my inf- my informative years of HR. You know, going from working in a uh, in Lancashire mill, uh, come warehouse to Littlewoods, to seven years later dealing with some very interesting pieces in some terror. It's great. And I loved it. And, and we did do a fair bit of transformation over those two years. And then I was uh, uh, kind of serenaded by uh, Charles Dunstan and Carphone Warehouse. And his group HR director, who I'd met a couple of times before, phoned me up and said, we've bought this little uh, telecoms business called Opal Telecom down in Warrington. And we've just started a carrier pre-select um, domestic um, service called Talk Talk. And we need an HR di- director. Do you fancy it? I mean, that was the interview, basically. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I do fancy it. So, m- much to my chagrin. And Ruth had already left Sontara. I had, I had already gone, there was yeah. no reason for me to stay whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I moved across to, to this uh, up-and-coming little telecoms business uh, and had an amazing uh, but very full-on three years as we went from a, a small... Uh, minor player to one of the biggest telecoms providers in in Britain, uh, and that was at the point when we broadband was just coming in. So it's 2005 I joined, uh, yeah, and it was very full on, but really enjoyed it. At one stage, had a, a, an overall team of size of 70, which again kind of blew my mind, mm. and the imposter syndrome got very very heightened during those days. I can tell you, but yeah. Uh, Thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, but was burnt out after three years because we, it was such a rapid growth. Uh, and then moved on to uh, doing a little bit of consultancy for BAE Systems, which was kind of really from Talk Talk to BAE Systems. Mm. Uh, but again, gave me some great diverse experience there for nine months and then joined a, um, a private equity owned business called 2020 Mobile. Uh, and uh, was part of the team that sold that uh, three years later. And then, uh, most recently, for a uh, for a permanent role, I've uh, I've been, I've worked at Expedia for nearly four years as HR director yeah. there, and supporting global teams, literally from Seattle to Sydney and everywhere in between. And a much smaller fish in a much bigger pond, uh, but really enjoyed it. Really cool business. And again, I, I, I'm really fortunate. And you know, even in my Santerra, even in my Littlewoods days. Got to go to some amazing places. I mean, in Littlewoods, I got to Bolton for the first time. For and, uh, <laughs> All yeah, the men. I've never been to Bolton. Before. Even though I was born in Oldham, I've never been to Bolton. Uh, but no, I, I got to Singapore and India for three months while I was in Littlewoods. Uh, uh, and then sort of with Amadeus, travelled all, all around sort of Europe, Middle East, Africa, but with uh, Expedia, was regularly going to Seattle where the headquarters are, but also got to places like Sydney, which I loved, and San Francisco, and... Uh, Tokyo and places like that. So it's great. And left that after four years, did a little bit of consulting then back with my dear friends at BA Systems and Rolls Royce Maritime. Uh, but I'm not allowed to tell you any more about that. Uh, <laughs> on pain of death. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The MI5 uh, guys will come around to my house tonight and drag me out and I'll never be seen again. So if, uh, if this is my uh, eponymous uh, podcast, I'd like to thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> at this point. Uh, and, uh, and then most recently, I said, I, I, I've also done some executive coaching, which is that little bit. So I'm affiliate, uh, I'm accredited to uh, a certain um, uh, way of doing coaching with Marshall Goldsmith model, which is great. And then most recently, having jo- now joined Motorsport Network. So, yeah, a, a full on. And again, uh, uh, I'm, I'm t- to, to Nick Charles Dunstan, who owns Carphone Warehouses, I'm the luckiest guy since Ringo. <laughs> uh, because I've kind of fallen in, and even Sunterra was a blast. I mean, you know, joking apart, we had some, oh. we had some dodgy times, but man alive! I mean, oh, we know, had some, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had some character was, building. Oh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we had, we had great fun as well. I mean, it's, <laughs> again, it was it was never a matter of life and death. Almost got to be a matter of life and death once when the sales director told me that I could never go into any of his sales areas again without his permission first. Um, but other than that, it was a. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, I've, I've been really blessed. I'm really lucky, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been fun. And you know, my career brought me up to these wonderful parts up here in North Lancashire mm. as a Lancastrian born lad. Uh, I've been up in, you know, this was going to be a, a temporary move, and 17 years later, I'm I'm still here, still feel the outsider, mind, 
but very much kind of uh, yeah. This is this is where myself and my family are now based. And uh, despite having worked across the country and beyond, this is home for me. And 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 you mentioned obviously. So you you know you speak Spanish fluently. I do. Well, you do. So did you do si. that? <laughs> If only I could give you an eloquent response to that, but I won't. So in, t- <laughs> in terms of, did you learn that when you were out there? Had you already no. got that language skill? What, uh, what? Yeah, it was my, my parents. So I got taken on holiday to the same place in Spain every year since I was three months old. My parents have been going there before. So I spoke a bastardized version of Spanish because it was near Valencia and Barcelona. So they spoke a, a dialect. And did it at school and loved it and then went on to university and did business management and uh, Spanish at, uh, at Leeds. Uh, at, sorry, sorry, at Leeds. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a geek uh, when it comes to, I just love, well, as you can tell, folks, I love talking anyway. And I've got the opportunity to talk in Spanish. Uh, so even I've been recently interviewing for a very senior role in our business and one of the candidates was from Spain. So for five minutes, I was just going off and talking about, oh, yeah, you're from San Sebastian. And started talking Spanish to her as well. So, but it has afforded me the opportunity to, to for, for my career as well. Mm. So, you know, not only at Amadeus, well, the business language was English. And a lot of people I was working with over there who didn't speak any Spanish, I had a Spanish team. Uh, of two or three people, so I'd always make sure that we spoke Spanish in in, in our one to one meetings. I mean, I've even given gone to an HR conference in Madrid and given a presentation for half an hour in Spanish, and they didn't get any of my jokes. <laughs> Not to be fair, though, Dom. Yeah, that, yeah, also, yeah, that, that also happens <laughs> over here as well. <laughs> no, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and when I was at this private equity company, 2020 Mobile, it, we had a very, uh, our Spanish business was run by a very entrepreneurial, very switched on guy, but he was, uh, let's say he was his own man. Uh, and he spoke pretty good uh, English, but when I had to have those grown up conversations with dear old Herman, uh, I always made sure that I would do it in Spanish. And he, he then kind of knew that it was serious. <laughs> so, <laughs> so- in terms of without obviously naming any names, but as a HR yeah. director, you will have yeah. you'll have set strategy. You know, you'll have done the very yeah. high level stuff. You'll have done cultural change. You'll have done you know introduction of new frameworks. All the things that come yeah. with that very lofty position. Yeah. But in addition to that, you'll have dealt with some interesting cases. Yeah, yeah. For the Enjoy benefit it. of an audience, <laughs> what, what would be your most absolutely, okay. you sit there, head in your hands, what in God's name, bonkers case? Well, I've got a really wowsers one, and, and I will share, and I always talk about, you know, well, that's another, that's another chapter in the HR autobiography when I write it. So um, these happen relatively close to each other, but um, I got a call from, um, okay, yeah, it was when I was at Talk Talk, and, and the the head of security for Carver Warehouse Group phoned me up uh, and said, and I kid you not, um, said, you're going to get a phone call in the next hour from MI5. And it's like, yeah. It's, it's, listen, it's June. It's not April. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> We've given them your number. Uh, and uh, uh, long story short, uh, we had an employee in one of our contact centres who let's say the security services were paying particular interest in. And they asked us, uh, they asked us whether they could come and interview him, but not let him know. And it's like, well, you can't really say no to James Bond, can you? You know? <laughs> uh, so yeah, of course. And the hilarious thing was, this was on a Thursday. And I said, well, yeah, good. Um, I, think it was, I think it was actually it was in August or something like that. <laughs> it was in August. I said, well, yeah, we, we, you know, we'll set up a, a, some kind of meeting one-to-one with his manager and we can do it at, at the site. You can come along, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll set that up for Monday. And he went, yeah, Monday. Oh, no, no, Monday. It's a bank holiday. I don't work on Mondays. And he's like, well, that's a good, that's a reassuring thing to know that MI5 don't work on bank holidays. <laughs> so, any, so anyway, we, we, we set up this, uh, I got my team in this site where I were to, I explained it in very kind of hushed tones. And sorted it all out, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, 
the uh, the guy came in, and then uh, one of the the MI five agent uh, officer came in, and, and they had a, a I think a quiet word in his shell, like. But the uh, the denouement to this was I hadn't met the guy, so I got my team to one of the team to sort it out at the site. And then he phoned me up about a week later and went, yeah, well, I'm going to come and just give you some insight now into what we're doing. So you're aware in terms of, you know, what steps we've taken. It's like, oh, well, fair enough, great. So I'm expecting, you know, an Aston Martin to rock up <laughs> in the car park at the headquarters and someone to come in with, all, you know, he's just been to CQ and he's got all his latest <laughs> gadgets and stuff like that. Well, when the guy turned up, I thought he'd come to sort out the air conditioner. <laughs> Because he's like, it was nothing like you expected. You know, Daniel Craig, no, well, not, even, not even Craig David, this guy, I tell you. Uh, and and to, to make it even more disappointing, he had the worst laptop ever. It was covered in dust. I think it ran on coal. So, yeah, that, 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 was, that was one of those whereby... Uh, Hey, I've worked with MI5. So did that, did um, that, so presumably that pissed all over any childhood dream that you had of an MI5 agent yeah. then, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, but it's, it's also the closest I've ever come to, you know, being an MI5 agent. As I say, you know, when, when I was working <laughs> at BA Systems afterwards, over in Wharton near Preston, and it was for the, uh, for, for the aviation side, I said, it's the closest I ever came to being in Top Gun. It's <laughs> almost... But not quite throughout my HR career. You know, always the bridesmaid. Bridesmaid. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and what's been <clears throat> you know, one of the fun? I mean, I, I mean, I think I could probably think of some of them that you and I have had to deal with. But <laughs> one of the, one of the funniest kind of you haven't just said that. Uh, 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 well, apart from when I interviewed you, you mean? Um, <laughs> yeah, I. I um, I was again at Talk Talk. talk. Uh, we were we set up a contact centre in house, but offshore in Cape Town, and we wanted to have a contact centre uh, manager, a you know, senior guy, to run it over in in, uh, in Cape Town. Uh, and I knew that South Africans were straight talking. You know, Afrikaans, a bit like the Dutch. You know, they're, yeah. they're very straight talking. So myself and my my colleague, uh, who I'm still good friends with to this day, a guy called Steve Vescola, interviewed this guy for the role. And I've got to say that I've never heard anyone in a formal uh, interview drop the C-bomb so many times. <laughs> it was kind of, by the end, it was just, just wind this up. I mean, he was, you know. <laughs> Being very, very direct and to the point, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then silly wow. did it. <laughs> like, yeah. Funnily enough, we gave him the job. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. <laughs> and that was one of those where, when he left, we we just kind of sat there in silence for two minutes and went, "Right, next candidate." Yeah, <laughs> I, I can remember in my very early career, um, running call centres. And it was for a very um, well-known telecoms firm in the UK. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. oh. And there was there was a particular lady. Um, well, actually, this was back. This was we're probably just being privatised. So yeah. we're just getting rid of the mentality of we're part of the post office. You know, your yeah. name was Tipex on the back of your chair. You know, <laughs> you could smoke at your desk and bring your slippers in, kind of yeah. thing going on. And um, we're just. <laughs> We'd, we'd opened a place in Preston, and it was the business side of it. And we'd, we'd interviewed a lady, or, or a lady had been interviewed. She'd been offered a job. It wasn't really part of my, my remit by that point. And I was, I'd was, i been brought in to, to hear an appeal um, mm. due to a lot of non-attendance. There was a suspect crash in a car park. And uh, I think also <laughs> there'd been an excuse that she couldn't attend work because her toilet had exploded and um, fallen through her ceiling. So things got more and more elaborate. Her attendance got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and um, as part of the investigation, I had to go and look at her desk, just for reasons I can't, I won't explain now, but I had to go and look at her desk and I had to check parts of her desk and stuff. And underneath her desk were litre bottles. Two, you know those kind of, the other bottles that you get, uh, the two litre bottles that you get of lemonade? There was, there was, yeah, there was, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That you would take to every kind of naff party you ever went to, you know. And there was, <laughs> there was, yeah, absolutely. There was loads of them lined up underneath the desk. It's a very bizarre. Uh, and of course, the colleague next said, "Oh, yes, she, 
this person in particular drinks some more. You know, she's always drinking pop, always drinking pop, always got off to the loose. Um, but these things were kind of swelling slightly, <laughs> so I can t- put the lid off one of them uh, to smell it and and, and realise that the lemonade it was not. Um, no, actually, and she was she was it it was just spirits topped up with the tiniest bit <laughs> so this yeah. woman is basically just down in a liter and a half of i think it was vodka um i don't know by the hour yeah. every other hour whatever it was so the crash in the car park then made perfect sense <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah she was absolutely handcarted on her way yeah. to work and leaving work yeah, yeah. and then um, while she was in the office as well i guess was a bit of a giveaway well, but a giveaway and she used to have this weird shuffly walk and I thought she had some kind of arthritic condition. I realised it wasn't. It was because she was pissed as a handcart and couldn't yeah. really move. But but when I went back to try and look at her forms, and that's why the MI5 thing just amused me, was because I said to them, how has this woman got through a reference? You know, well, let's have a look. And she obviously yeah. needs help and support. You know, in today's world, she would have needed help and support. Yeah. Um, and her rationale for not being able to provide any references was that she was part of a witness protection programme and she'd had to change her name. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and do you know what? Oh, that the, old story. Yeah, and the very young and green team leader at the time was more fascinated by the story, yeah. got totally hoodwinked, and offered her the job. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's the richness of, I mean, again, having worked in so many different, diverse, not only organisations, but in different countries as well. You know, I, I, I always say, and, and again, I do not wish to offend anybody here. Please do not take it the wrong way. Just based on a two-day experience. I've been fortunate enough throughout my career to visit some amazing countries and Nigeria because I had probably the worst ever experience when I was at Amadeus visiting Lagos uh, where the corruption, the, the the you know official corruption was so evident from the moment I was told that my passport visa wasn't valid and I needed to give them money, having a uh, an armed guard car take me to the hotel. The hotel itself was awful as well. And, and but I've met some incredible. And, and I, I t- tell that story because despite the fact that I didn't really enjoy my visit to Nigeria, it wasn't because of the team that we had in Nigeria who. Were wonderful people and you know whether it's meeting those guys whether it's back at Santera um, being invited by the cleaners at one of the resorts down in Fuengirola to have lunch with them and they'd never done that with this you know one of the main sort of senior managers mm. before and they were in the little kind of their little room where all the kind of cleaning stuff was but they were making a, a fish stew in there so I sat with them and had this fish stew and they, again part of it because the lingo and what have you like that meeting ladies in the old uh, in the old mills which little woods had who, who were literally those who would take their slippers or have their slippers in the locker so yeah. go across the road because they lived in the terrace house across the road would go into the mill and they'd be doing that for 35 years yeah yeah you know? yeah and then uh, uh, so yeah it absolutely you know characters galore from yeah. meeting the cleaners to meeting people like uh, charles dunstan Dara Karashawi, who was president of Expedia, who now runs Uber, who's an incredible leader, you know, and I'm really privileged to not only work with work with him, but know him a little bit as yeah. well. And stuff like that. You know, again, luckiest guy since Ringo. It's kind yeah. of this lad who was born in Oldham, lived in Old Sager all his life, and you know, was average Joe at school. And that, that, having had uh, you know a really diverse and interesting uh, a career up to, up to up to now. Listen, I've got three daughters it ain't finishing just yet i can tell you also <laughs> we're still having these podcasts when i'm 70 um, yeah. uh, but you know that, that autobiography that's that's going to be you know four or five thick volumes yeah and yeah it's, it's itself will just be two volumes well, the, the, uh, without question, not <laughs> least, not least, every time they announce some form of conference, and you thought, well, you know, the conference will be fine. The evening entertainment yeah. will be interesting, <laughs> yeah. but the discipline <laughs> cases will be numerous yeah. thereafter. Yeah. The, morning after, the morning after, in all its connotations, will be very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of you know, looking at the, this this past year, or yeah. well, looking at twenty twenty, just full stop. Um, as as somebody who has all that experience for not just an organisation but an organisation's well being and culture and all of those things, what are you taking away from the impact of of COVID on on yeah. organisations? So there's a, there's a few things. So first of all, I I worked for Amadeus, who were absolutely directly affiliated to the airlines. 
when the two planes hit the towers back in 2001. Uh, and again, that's one of those where were your moments. And I was actually in the post office back home in Allsager at the time, back, back home. Uh, um, and the whole business model of that, uh, of us as a, a business affiliated to the travel industry, particularly airlines, has changed in, in an instant and what have you. Uh, and what, what made it really clear to me is all these super smart people who we had from various business schools, INSEAD, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we talk about the talent, uh, you know, the, the high potentials. Well, I think what we saw there is if it ain't in the back of the uh, back of the book in terms of back the, the manual, MBA, that. They, hadn't got a, they hadn't got a clue. So it was like, you know what, this is one we've got to figure out. And I think that kind of you've got to figure it out and figure it out pretty darn quickly has, has stayed with me since then, particularly. What I've seen with COVID uh, is the, and it's been really interesting. So we've had like almost three or four phases of it. The first phase, which was almost a year ago uh, when we went into lockdown one, what we saw globally in businesses was in general, actually a massive increase in engagement across businesses uh, and a massive in increase in trust of leadership as well. So you were suddenly getting leaders being shown to be genuinely concerned about the welfare, the well-being of their teams, having you know weekly, if not daily, catch-ups, et cetera, et cetera. And I think at the time we thought, well, yeah, this will be a few weeks. And yeah, a few days, then it was going to be a few weeks, and that's it. So there was this almost novelty part to it for, mm. for organizations mm. to go, okay, well, yeah, this is, this is something new. And again, the, the, the data that was coming out from May, you know, so for the first two months saw, you know, a significant increase in a lot of organizations. We then had that strange period in the summer that, that kind of a bit like that film Awakenings where everything was forgotten for a little while and we came back and Rishi Sunat was paying for us to go out to dinner and all that kind of thing. And it was like, well, this is going to be normal again soon, you know, sooner or later. And then bang, you know, it, it started all over again. And I think what we've seen both during the kind of autumn with the tier one to five and what have you, and subsequently with the lockdown again, is it's been a lot, lot harder for organisations and the engagement has suddenly diminished. I've been talking to some managers who first time round were, yeah, we get the team together two, three times a week and we just have a chat and yeah, we talk about it. Now saying, I don't want to have meetings with my team. I, I, I don't know what I can tell them. There's nothing new I can tell them. They're looking for answers from me and I haven't got those answers. And I think this is where now leadership really is finding it, it is struggling to, to come to a, a clear view in terms of what we're going to do for the, even for the next few weeks until we come out of the lockdown. You know, we've got some set dates now, but as we know, you know, yeah. Boris and his chums are able to flex those dates, mm -hmm. understandably to a degree as well. But more importantly is what's going to happen afterwards and have businesses already got a plan, a strategy in place in terms of back into the office or what work will look like moving forward. There's a lot of organizations already who are looking to downsize. We're one of them. Uh, you know, we're going we're, we're to move out of our office in Richmond in, in, uh, in, in, down in London by the end of the year. And that was because of the lease. But now we've recognized we can get somewhere smaller. I know Vodafone are, have put together a kind of future office in the center of London, which is very much built around flexible working. But uh, as, as you pointed out before we, we went, uh, we started recording, you know, one, one of the key things is how do we ensure that the, the team ethos and the team engagement and that just human contact, which people have really missed out on, is maintained? Because we say, well, you know what, we can do this moving forward. We can have a lot greater flexibility. But I think it needs to be flexibility rather than everybody working from home. And for every one person who's going oh, this is all right, this, you know, and there's been some real benefits. I'm not having to commute. It's cost me less. I can take the dog out for a walk mid-morning and mid-afternoon, uh, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? Yep, I work into the evening, but if I want an hour off and watch Loose Women or whatever, like, I can do that. You know, yeah. I don't, but I can. Uh, yeah, I could do. Um, and, and suddenly to go, well, you can't do that anymore. So how are we going to get that balance? Because... It's going to be really, really difficult just to expect people to switch back to as it was before, and they're not going to be able to. No, and I think I think the transition coming out was 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 wasn't was difficult, but we didn't have time to recognise it as being difficult because it was it, it, it was mandated. So yeah. you're at home, so you know there was no transition periods. It was just you are, and then and, and you aren't. So that that was that was it done. Yeah. Whereas 
the reverse is very different. And also the reverse now has been a year. Yeah. So, you know, suddenly you're at home for a few weeks was one thing to get your head around. Now it's you've been at home for a year. In a year, a lot of your life actually can change. And, and now we're, we're, bring, we're going to bring you back in. And, and the transition of bringing peop, people back in, that mental health, wellness, disruptive, yeah. hold on a minute, everything's changing. Some people aren't great with change. Some people are fine to adapt to change. I, I wonder how businesses, not just looking at the logistics of doing it, that's one yeah. part of the plan, but actually the impact of of doing so, it emotionally on somebody yeah is that part of their totally. plan you know yeah well it's it's the other interesting thing and i would say this wouldn't i but, but uh, as an hr person is for the last at least 10 years there's been two things that have been really high on my agenda and have not have been given scant regard by the companies i've worked with for various reasons one of those is about well-being of staff and well-being was a you know almost when it first started to talk about that kind of early 2000s, uh, you know, we were being, to use the mot du jour, a bit of a snowflake, mm. you know, well-being. Well, you know, what's that mean kind of thing as well? Yeah. Well-being now is one of the key central elements to any business moving forward, and that's going to be one of the key focus for HR. The other thing I've been talking to organisations, again, really up since the Suntera days, is this VUCA um, strategy. You know, VUCA is, comes from the uh, military side of things, which is um, volatility, uncertainty, change, and agility in terms of, you know, this is way before COVID was ever a thing. The military have to have this food because you never know what's going to come around the corner. You never know what's going to happen next. And therefore, how do we do that in a business uh, arena, basically? And whilst, you know, there were lessons to be learned, as I said, post 9-11 for certainly one or two of the industry sectors, Generally, there's never been anything like this. Yeah, we've had 2008 and, you know, the economic downturn, etc. But again, we've had those to some degree or other. And whilst it was painful for those directly affected, it wasn't something where you had to dramatically change your strategy. COVID is. And again, that VUCA uh, thinking is now going to be absolutely central because who knows what's going to come around the corner next? Yeah. I think this has been the kick up the backside that we've needed in terms of, you know, people like myself and other business leaders going, you need to be able to expect the unexpected at times. And mm. what's that going to look like? Mm. You know, so organizational design needs to be able to be really agile, really flexible for things. And sometimes it's really good stuff. And other times it's really horrible stuff like we've, mm. uh, well, like we've had in uh, over the last 12 months or so. Um, I would like to think there's going to be a lot of learning from this. My suspicions are that it will be a little bit of a hodgepodge and some will uh, and others won't. And, you know, it's very... Yeah, the, to hear the uh, uh, one of the key guys in Goldman Sachs Bank two days ago saying that working from home is, quote, an abomination, that really doesn't help matters, does it? When you've got someone like that at a high lofty like saying, well, you know, this bank, we don't operate like that, so I'm expecting all my team to come back. How did the people working in Goldman Sachs react to that, who've been working from home and probably struggling to begin with? Yeah. And then they hear a, you know, a fat cat who runs the bank saying something like that. It's 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 dreadful, it really is. So there are forward thinking leaders, uh, and I think there's a lot more of those than the idiot in Goldman Sachs, but nonetheless, you know, we're going to have to think around, uh, and again, the influences within organisations, and that's not just the CEOs and chairman, but the rest of us as well think, how do we influence this business moving forward to make sure that we do have that greater level of flexibility from a commercial perspective? Because guess what? Our customers are expecting different things now as mm -hmm. well. You know, we're looking at, we, we, you know, most of our business is based around digital platforms, but nonetheless, you know, we do some solid stuff as well. We sell tickets uh, we host events, etc. We're going to have to change that. But for many other organisations, which uh, you know, whereby they have been absolutely pulverised, be it the you know the, the independent store owner or or whatever, you know, they they have got to rethink their their commercial strategy from the ground up. Yeah. Uh, and then and, and again and and people like yourself, Ruth, not blowing smoke anyway. You know, you're really great in helping these guys as well. Think around that. Some of the work you've been doing over the, well, all the work you've been doing. Yeah over the last 12 months. 
really important because it, you know coming together as a community be it as, as an industry be it as a town or whatever like that or just a small number of independent uh, sort of uh, commercial people really really important because nobody can do this on their own well that no absolutely not and i think i, I do wonder sometimes where in, in these circumstances or these times small businesses whilst they have been absolutely you know battered have got somewhat of an advantage when it comes to coming out of things yeah. because of their ability to, to 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 be more flexible and to be more reactive and responsive because there's not a huge you know roadmap of change about to arrive they are slightly better equipped to shift quickly um yeah. <clears throat> after their initial as you rightly say their initial oh my god you know i was a I was a bricks and mortar business and now I've had to become something different. Yeah. But but in addition, coming back to, to, to business in its full flight, hopefully when, you know, the June date passes, um, I suppose some of those smaller businesses will find it easier to get that momentum yeah. than the, some of yeah. those very large organisations. Yeah, if they've not been flattened in the interim yeah. uh, and are able to get back up. But, yeah, I'm, I, I got a card through the letterbox. I'm sure you had it uh, just this week from a guy who's running this Morgan Bay chowder business. So he's, he's, he's saying, would you be interested in buying chowder? Which is, I love food. So yeah. straight away, I'm going to look at that. And it's like that kind of initiative yeah. whereby he's, 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 he's going, I will, you know, if, if I get enough interest then I'll set it up. And I think he's going to have a little cart on the front at Morecambe in, in the summer and stuff like that. It's like, that's great. That's where those little sparks of light are in, in a very darkened sky, which is great. Yeah. been created by COVID, whereby you have got people going, okay, I can either keep going, this is really, really crap, and I've had a rubbish time, and we all have had a rubbish time, or actually acknowledge that, but actually do something positive and try to reignite either what I've got or come up with a new idea. Well, I, mean, I don't, I'm yeah, because I, you know, I could never come up with a new idea. Well, I, I, I think it has, it has uh, awakened that entrepreneurial spirit in a lot of people, probably yeah. more through necessity than choice. But I think there are some people also thinking, I'm not going to be in this position again. I need yeah. an alternative, a fallback, or something different. Um, yeah. Or actually you know oh my god this has made me realize what my life is really about how you know do i really want to be doing this job for the rest of my days i think it's probably given some people some difficult questions to yeah. reflect and answer actually as well yeah but you know it's caught to quote george w bush we're okay in this country but you know it's the french i mean they don't have a word for entrepreneur <laughs> Yeah, and don't don't misunderestimate him either. Just remember. <laughs> uh, I think we're I think we're, we're going to see some significant changes, both in terms of us as the consumer uh, and what our expectations are, uh, and you know also what is out there. And I think the, the consumer over the last ten or fifty, and maybe twenty years, become really, really, really sophisticated. You know, I was at, I was at Talk Talk Car Phone Warehouse when the iPhone came out the original number one and it was like man rediscovering fire or you know, inventing the wheel for the first time and it really was like that. I, I had one of my own six weeks before they came out you're now looking at them, people going oh, there's no change nothing new in that whatsoever you know, it's like, <laughs> I got a minute. you know we've gone from the this is amazing to uh, so I think we've the, the expectations of the consumer now far more sophisticated and, and the gap between what we can offer as a whether it's a product or a service and what they expect it used to be quite a big chasm and now it's really really narrow and so the, you know the winners are going to be those people who can really predict the next big thing be it service be it product or whatever else mm. uh, and again creative minds uh, are, are often sort of the people who, who drive uh, countries and industries out of the doldrums and mm. you know, I just hope that we've got enough kind of creative minds moving I'm pretty sure we have and it, you know, and it's that next it's our kids generation but it's, mm. not, it's not us anymore we're too old <laughs> it's kids, but, you know and it's and, and again looking at some of the some of the stuff I've seen already online and so you know there, there is real hope but we need to nurture this and we need to encourage it and we need to give support to it as well and I hope you know 
government initiatives are very much geared towards kind of encouraging that entrepreneurial spirit because that's where the next Charles Dunstan is going to, mm. God forbid, John Cordell even, is going to come from, the next Dyson, the next whoever is going to come from. They need to have the uh, the environment by which they're encouraged to do that and they can do yeah. that safely. And by safely, I mean that they don't, if they fail the first time, they don't give up. No, and they're not, and they're not told to go find a proper job yeah. either. Yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah absolutely. absolutely. So the other kind of topic that, that is has been the, the theme probably throughout almost the latter part of COVID it is mental health and, 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 and well-being. Yeah. So we touched on well-being before. And I think, as you say, before, you know, well-being was something that I think organisations might have ticked a box to say that they'd done. Yeah. I'm not sure whether they necessarily lived and, and, and breathed it. Um, yeah. What do you think is going to be the responsibility or focus of organisations going forward, particularly around mental health? Yeah, well, you know, w- without a or oh, doing a doing an Oprah, here, I've you know I've had mental health issues in the last five years myself through various bits and pieces, and so know what that's like personally. And I can't say you know there are uh, absolutely far far worse experiences for other people, but nonetheless, there's a lot of people out there who have gone through similar kind of uh, you know me- mental health issues to one degree or another. What I'm seeing now, going back to that well-being, is that we're now businesses are taking this far more seriously it still needs to move up but you know what mental health needs to be uh, moved up within the nhs the fact that if you want to if you get god forbid you get something like cancer you'll get seen pretty darn quickly on the nhs if you get something else which can be terminal in terms of can push you over the edge by the end in terms of mental health you're told you've got an eight week eight month waiting list Minimum. So you've got that kind of challenge going on at least mm. um, and I think as businesses we need to make sure that we can support our t- our individual team members and our collective teams together so one of the things that I've become more aware of in the last sort of 12 to 18 months is uh, mental health first aiders in businesses now whereby and there's a little bit of a double-edged sword that because that can be dangerous unless it's done properly you know, we're not all psychologists, we're not all counsellors or something like that. And suddenly I'm seeing, you know, become a mental health first aider for, you know, £199 or what have you like that. And that's kind of, oh, that's a little bit dangerous. You know, I wouldn't go to them uh, with, a, with a medical ailment unless I've cut my finger. Why would I do that with mental health? But nonetheless, yeah. it's at least showing some initiative in terms of what we do. And as long as those people are actually guided to, to guide the individual to go and get some expertise help, et cetera, that's the main thing. It needs to be blended into the wider community. You know, it's it's the responsibility of each and every one of us, from government, from NHS, uh, from communities, and from and from companies as well, to recognise, uh, you know, the, the the higher incidence of of mental health. You know, when I I'm, I'm I'm older than you, but certainly back in the day, in my formative years in the late seventies and early eighties, it was just not a thing you ever heard of. You know, and if anybody did have a mental health, it was kind of, oh, well, you know, he's, he's a little bit, you know, she's yeah. a little bit, whatever. whatever. And, and thankfully, that's not the case anymore. Nonetheless, we need to be very careful in terms of, because it is more overt and people are more comfortable talking about those things, but actually at the same time, that we don't almost trivialise it yes. a little bit through through that. You know, we've got to take it seriously. And as I said, it does worry me that, you know, I, I've met one or two people in, in other companies who say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a mental health first aider. And I've got to say, I've got, really? Gosh. You know, so that if we're taking it seriously, let's let's do it properly. Um, but it's a mass, it's, you know, you know better than I. Uh, it, it's, it's a massive area. And there are fantastic experts out there. Uh, but it is still very, you know, going back to the bridesmaid sort of analogy, mental health is, it's, it's not even the bridesmaid of, no. of, uh, to the bride. You know, <clears> it's, 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 it's the guest that only gets invited into the evening. Uh, the yeah, moment. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, you know, as an organisation, I have, certainly with my team, it, it, throughout the lockdown, we, we have a call every morning. And actually, the call really isn't about work. No. It really does start with the how are we all? How are you? Yeah. How are you? Um, yeah. And actually, you know, the flip side of that is that, that there's two things. You know, what 
to be listened to is one thing, but to felt to feel heard, yeah, is is the real transformational bit. It, that's the transformative yeah. bit when they feel heard and re- and things are remembered and things are checked up on and, and whatever. So a lot of our calls in the morning are very much about you as a person. The work thing actually then takes care of it itself because yeah. the taking care of the person has been the topic if you will so i know that sounds uh, 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 you know, yeah. it absolutely is true so what I, what i find happening is that the business takes care of itself that the, the the work that needs to be done is done but it's been done because the springboard of the day is the how are you question yeah and, and it's a genuine how are you right. yeah all right yeah and, and, you know on that coaching side of stuff i've done I talk about humility in leadership, and I, you know, I'm, I've coached two or three senior CEOs of various companies. Uh, and one of the thing, one of the common discussions I have with them is about active, genuine listening. So when you say "How are you?", actually stop, be aware. Absolutely, listen, yeah. You know, and for a lot of people, that's you know that. That, you know, how are you? It's just a kind of almost, uh, you know, uh, an excuse to move on to the next thing rather than uh, being a, an opportunity for that individual to say, actually, I'm going to tell you how I feel. And mm. I'm not expecting you to judge me. I'm not expecting you necessarily to have the magic wand and solve it. But I just want you to be aware of that as well. And that is something which is very much about changing behaviours. And, and I, when I say leaders, I'm not just talking about senior CEOs or owners of businesses. I'm talking about everybody, anybody who has a team, whether it's mm. two people or whether it's two and a half thousand people mm. or beyond or what have you. You're absolutely right. And you know, I th- again, I think we've seen a lot of this initially from COVID in terms of teams getting together, be it for the start of the day, end of the day, and talking about how they're feeling, talking about what box sets they've seen or, or whatever else. But I think even that's diminishing because as people are feeling even weary from that now and feeling a little bit guilty if when they're asked, how are you feeling? And they're still giving people the same genuine answer. It's like, I'm going to be judged here. But, you know, Mm. I've I've not kind of, I've not got a big enough set to, you know, to to get up to this kind of thing. And and that's, you know, that that needs to be, that needs to be changed. And I think leaders need to be uh, doing that beyond COVID as well. And as part of that, that actually that you mentioned, it kind of brings to mind something else for me, which is the resilience. So I'm not sure many organisations understand the benefit of working on the resilience of a person in an organisation. So there's coaching, there's how are you, there's all of those aspects. But then, you know, actually, if they looked at resilience as a competency, and actually we're going to help you become more resilient... I really uh, invested in that as a as a skill, effectively. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to call it a skill, but but you know that. No, that it is. But want of a better word. Um, I, I wonder how many businesses have thought about actually how how resilient are our people, and also yeah. how responsible are we as an organisation if they aren't feeling resilient. Yeah, it can be quite a divisive word as well because for some people, resilience means just get on with it. Come on, book your idea. So, yeah, we're yeah. all in this together kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas it's not that. And funnily enough, I've been doing some recruitment for uh, for an HR director for one of our businesses over in the States. And one of the key competencies that I've been sort of looking at is around their resilience. And that's just about how they navigate through turbulent times, challenges, et cetera, et cetera. And that doesn't always mean that they succeed either. It means actually that going back to that learning piece, you know, uh, and I, I very much subscribe, thankfully, I very much subscribe to that view in terms of, you know, feel free to fail, but when you fail, fall forwards. You know, mm. don't 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 keep making the same mistakes. Learn from it uh, in a positive way. Test and learn. That was a big mantra we had at Expedia, and it's the mantra I use to this day outside of work as well, as much as, much as inside of work. Uh, and that resilience piece, you're absolutely right. And talking uh, to various people when I was uh, doing that project across with uh, BA Systems and, and Rolls-Royce Maritime, which was based around sort of submarine manufacturing uh, and wanting to talk around resilience uh, to some of the people there, you know, they would be talking about, well, yeah, let's get somebody in who's been in a sub because they show resilience. You know, they're in a the sub for three months at a time. And it's like, you're not able to equate what they're, just because they have a really interesting story 
Just that's, yeah. That, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's not what... And endur- yeah, an endurance is not resilience either. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get that bloke who, walked, who went up to uh, you know Everest twice. That's what resilience is. Well, how can I apply that into my day-to-day work and yeah. what have you? I know. So, uh, it, and, but even resilience, you know, it's about not being on your own. Resilience for me mm-hmm. is having the bottle, for want of a better word, to say, I need help here. Yeah. Can you help me? I'm not. I'm not in a great place. You know, I, I listen to uh, various podcasts, and one I really enjoy is uh, John Robbins and Ellis. Um, oh, got me second. The Welsh comedian, uh, um, and they they have a podcast uh, called How Do You Cope, and they just talk to various celebrities about Ellis James. Sorry, uh, about various uh, celebrities about some of the uh, mental health issues that they found, and they they start at every podcast with. How's your shame? It's really not how you're feeling, but how's your shame? And that's really interesting because again, it's kind of you do feel shameful when these and you shouldn't have to feel that way. No, no. Um, it's yeah. So st- stuff like that, I think we're still very much at, at the, the tip of the iceberg for this. Um, but people are beginning to feel a more co- a little bit more comfortable about sharing that, and secondly, a little bit more comfortable asking that as well because that's the thing whereby if i ask him or her how he or she is feeling and they open up oh my god what's going to happen yeah what am i going to do with the information yeah because i've got a massive agenda here in terms of work stuff i want to go through with them so if i ask them how they are then that might take up all the meeting yeah well it might do you know what and you might have to reschedule for that commercial stuff but actually that's a good investment in your time and a good investment in their time because actually if you don't cover it and they finish that meeting all it's going to do is even drag them down further because you've got even more stuff to do rather than, well, actually, I feel supported. Because if you feel supported, you're probably halfway there to actually addressing it. Absolutely. So as we wrap things up now, I'm going to ask you a couple of wild card questions. What has been (laughs) your... What's been your... um, most memorable point of learning, do you think? The thing that that has served you well? Oh, right. Okay. So I will go back to those dear old ladies in the mill. Uh, and as you know, Ruth, as well, <laughs> as much as I do, I'm not exactly Mr. Detail. I'm not exactly Mr. Detail. Detail, retail. Mr. Blue Sky thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Here's an idea. Let's go with it. Oh, I'm bored with that. Let's go to something else. <laughs> so follow up, etc. isn't really the greatest thing. And when I was that personnel and training officer back in Littlewoods, we unfortunately had to make some redundancies and it was the first time ever that I'd done something like that. And I've never done a calculation. So anyway, I asked the uh, personnel administrator, could you get me the redundancy figures for these people? And kind of almost accepted that, well, that must be right. She's pulled off the figures. So we went to this mill in Bolton and gave the people their redundancy figures and then discovered that they were completely wrong and we'd cited far much more money than they should have been getting. I laughed. It wasn't like, it wasn't nice at all. So, and that was really early on in my uh, career. So despite me being detailed schmita, one thing I do now do <laughs> is just check the numbers, <laughs> check the detail, <laughs> check the small prints. <laughs> For fear of costing yourself hundreds of thousands or, of pounds. As, or as I've always done, actually, get a really good, detail-driven person working for you. So I had Nikki Rikusia when I was at Santera. I had Catherine Haywood when I was at uh, uh, when I was at Talk Talk. I've got a great HR director, Jane, now. And, and they're the ones who kind of, look, you know my strengths. I bring in people who are far better than me at the stuff I'm crap at. Yeah. And God forbid... God forbid I should bring in someone like me who'd do my head in. <laughs> Having someone like me and my team, I'd be, oh, it'd be awful. <laughs> so I bring in people who are far better at the stuff I'm no, I'm, I'm no good at. That's, again, that's the other learning thing in terms of don't do the halo effect, don't bring in lots of mini doms because that, that would just be bedlam. Bring in people to really compensate for, yeah. for your own deficiencies. And I've learned from that and I've learned from them accordingly. And also those people that can challenge as well. You need the challenge, don't you, from a team? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, I've been, you know, I've been challenged <laughs> throughout my career. <laughs> I am a challenge and I've been challenged. <laughs> well, that's the point to end on. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today. It's been great. 
I'd, I'd love it. Same, same time next week, then. I'll get the guitar next time <laughs> so we can do some songs. I want that only if you're cross-legged on the floor. <laughs> yeah, no, not the first time I've heard that either. <laughs> Bye-bye for now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Thanks for listening and we hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to hear more from us in the future, why not subscribe on your favourite podcast platform? If you'd like to be featured in one of our podcast interviews, then why not contact us? You can search us across social media as The Consult Centre or contact us at hello at theconsultcentre.com. Bye for now.